Yo, Elliot, I've been in the program for a few months and have skimmed through the first few lessons, but haven't really finished with the massive action plan yet. I've been struggling with a lot of feelings of inadequacy. Part of me wants to live a life of virtue and be a part of this growing movement of manliness. However, I'm HIV positive. This brings me feelings of great pain and regret when I think about it. I'm ashamed to admit it. I'm ashamed to talk about it. Uh, I'm also terrified of the way the world is going now. I'm scared of the new world order and the encroaching authoritarianism. I'm worried that one day and maybe soon I'll have the very medication that I take that keeps me alive it used as a bargaining chip, an ultimatum used for control. Sometimes this fear is paralyzing. I think about how short life is in general, and then I remember that mine is even shorter no matter what I am filled with this, uh, whatever I'm filled with this inescapable feeling of absolute dread, clutching at my soul and squeezing the air from my lungs. Do you have any advice for not feeling this way? This is something that I heard from Chad Ripperger. Uh, Father Ripperger on YouTube, if you ever get a chance to look him up, his channel is uh, Census Fidelium. And he talks about uh, living, living a life of mortification. Also, St. Ignatius of Brianashov speaks about this. A lot of the saints speak this way. In fact, a lot of saints, as they leave this life, they wish they had more pain. I've also heard him talk about, and other, you know, uh, teachers talk about how the saints and the angels, you know, those that, are, that, are, that, are, that have left the body, who are living in the supernatural, they look at us and they wish that they had some of the struggles that we have, right? Why is that? Why would a divine, why would a divine person or a saint or an ascetic or someone on the holy road want a life of misery? And it's because it gets you to practice the, the virtue of mortification. I love the fact that you say you want to live a life of virtue, right? But you're, you're given the greatest tool to live a life of virtue, which is challenge. Aristotle says no virtue is born in a vacuum. What does he mean by that? He means you don't grow virtue without struggle. You don't grow virtue by bumping up and against resistance. You don't go get virtue without wrestling with vice. It doesn't just descend upon you. You don't just get virtue. You got to fight for it. And the way you get virtue is by fighting your vices. And right now you have a mental vice. Your lowly thinking, your shame about yourself, the way you're judging yourself, all your worry, all your fear, all that paralyzing, petrified behavior, this the inescapable feeling of absolute dread. These are the very tools for your salvation. They're the very resistance, the forms of resistance for you to overcome. They say that God gives specific demons to specific people, meaning your problems are exactly the problems you're supposed to have for you to overcome to sanctify your soul. Same thing for me, right? Like I've got issues, right? One of my issues to overcome is like pride, right? That's one of them that just comes natural to me. And I'm like, man, I'm fighting with this thing all the time, but it is through that wound that your rebirth happens. You say, do you have any advice for not feeling this way? I am going to tell you, continue to feel that way, continue to continue to embrace it and then turn it, transmutate it into your new birth. Robert Bly says every wound is a womb. Every wound is a womb. What does that mean? It's an opening by which the new you can be burned out of. Right. You don't you don't be born again. You can't be reborn. You can't be renewed if you are not wounded. It's through the wounds. This is, this is ancient stuff too. It's not just Christian. Like I said, Aristotle says that virtue is not born in a vacuum. But if you read like a lot of the pagan mythology, uh, I, I think it is Dionysus. Dionysus was torn to shreds by the giants. I don't remember exactly how it goes, but this is Greek mythology. Dionysus was torn to shreds. They tore, every, they tore from head to toe. In other words, he had a life kind of like yours. The giants were the men in charge of the day, right? It could be a metaphor for the men that were in charge. Well, the men in charge of the day right now have 
created biological weapons. They're creating bargaining chips. They're going to be ultimatums. There's going to be war. They're tearing you to shreds. But one thing that they couldn't do, I think they call them the Titans. One thing that the Titans couldn't do, or one thing they overlooked, was his heart. And so they tore him to shreds, but only his heart remained. And it's from his heart that he was born again. What does that mean? It means that your core is what matters most. You could have a disease. You could have lose your limbs. You could be under authoritarianism, totalitarianism. You can be under tyranny. You could be under persecution. You could be suffering and struggling under all kinds of stuff, but your heart remains. As long as your heart remains, there's a possibility for reconstitution or remembering right? Remember, you, you're being dismembered, but the heart remembers. The heart pulls all pieces together because the heart knows that there's a divine reality. There's an intangible reality to you. You've got a soul and it can't touch that. Nobody can touch that. HIV can't touch that. Totalitarians can't touch that. War can't touch that. Dionysus is also known as the god of wine. Wine. Why is Dionysus known as the god of wine? Because in order to create wine, what do you have to do? You got to crush those grapes, right? I don't know how they do it any, any more, longer, but I remember watching like, you know, TV movies and stuff like that when I was a kid. And they would make wine. They'd have this big vat. They put all beautiful grapes, beautiful, succulent, fresh grapes. And then what happens? They go in there and they mash it. They mash up, you gotta mash up those grapes. You gotta squash those grapes. You gotta pulverize them to make wine. Dionysus is the god of destruction, tearing, shredding, and wine. You don't get wine without the shredding. And the essence of Dionysus is still available in the wine because his heart was untouched. This is the story of the saints. I would invite you to, first of all, life is so much easier when you have faith. It just is because you have examples to live by. One thing I took that I didn't know, I was a quote unquote Catholic, right? I mean, I, they made me read the stories and I went to CCD and I did confirmation, but I knew nothing about the saints. I knew nothing about the mystics. I knew nothing about the fathers and the desert fathers and the men that lived under persecution and the men that created monasteries and the men that became monks and hermits and lived in the mountains and lived in caves and fasted for days and mortified their flesh and offered everything of their being to the Lord. These men crave challenge. They crave whipping shredding, tearing, because they know that it's going to afford the sweetness of their life. But you have to have a spiritual mindset, a religious mindset. Remember I said that it's hard to live as a Catholic, but easy to die? In a way, when I use that word mortification, according to uh, Chad Ripperger, you know, I started with that. I learned from Father Ripperger, this word mortification, it really means to die. You're dying. He offers mortification as a virtue. You're dying, but it's not holy mortification. You're not, you're not, there's a holy suffering. Did you know that? You can offer up your suffering to be a holy suffering, but it's all about perspective. Is my shredding, is my tearing, are my challenges making wine? Or am I just going to be, you know, torn up, shred up and, and, and nasty and gross? That's really up to you. The Titans couldn't touch the heart. And so he's reconstituted and known as the God of wine. This is the same for the martyrs. I, if you're looking for inspiration, especially in this day where, where the diabolical is so damn strong and Satan is everywhere, it's pervasive. I, a part of me feels sad that we live in this world. But another part of me is glad that we live in this world because we were called here during one of the toughest times to be alive and specifically to be a man of faith, to fight against these challenges that we're facing. 
That's why I'm a strong man, because I love challenge. I love resistance. And I love overcoming and triumphing. You, my man, have the opportunity to be a strong man and to have that virtue and to grow in manliness if you see yourself rightly. And right now you're seeing yourself wrongly. Anytime you, this is something that somebody said to me the other day, and I, I, take, it, I take it literally. He says, any thought you have, any engage, anything you engage in, any feeling you have, any job you take, any work you do, anything, if it is to glorify me, it's not of God. If it's to glorify God, it's for God. It's, it's of God. That's how, I think it was Roosh. I was reading Roosh B's blog. I like Roosh, right? Especially since he became a Christian. I, he, in a way, he inspired me too. It was one of his recent blogs about judging. And he said something to the effect of, uh, if I'm doing it for me, that means it's of my fallen nature and that it's not of God. If I'm doing it or thinking it or, 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 or offering it up, which I'm offering you, offer it up to God, then it's of God. All of your plight, all of your challenges, all these bad, so-called bad things that are happening to you could very easily be offered up for your salvation. Look into it. I'm not an expert in this, and a lot of these ideas are brand new to me, and I'm wrestling with them as, as we speak. I'm learning about them over the past five years. But I want you to dig because you're suffering right now. Look into holy suffering. I wish I had a book here maybe to refer you to. Um, the Life of the Saints. There's a book called The Lives of the Saints that I have here. I'm trying to see if I have any book, books on holy suffering. Just go on YouTube even. Look, go on YouTube and look up holy suffering, holy mortification. It's not about changing your circumstances. It's about embracing your circumstances for your salvation, for your spiritual growth. And I think you can do that. I think it's worthwhile. And I think it's a, um, I think it's a noble path, right? Your situation with the HIV, you know what that can do? That can make you celibate. You know what I'm really realizing and want to speak more to? The value of a celibate life. All of the most holy men were virgins. I spoke about this last week. Our world has really confused us in terms of value uh, by making us believe that it's found in sex. Our value is not found in sex. In fact, according to St. Paul, sex is a weakness. He says, if you can't be celibate like me and you must marry or you must have sex and marry. That's what he says. He says, First, try to be like me. But if you must, then marry. So, you, you know, your, your growing in manliness has nothing to do with sex. Oh, okay, cool. Well, he says he's a girlfriend. He's going to marry her someday. I thought the uh, HIV thing was, was sort of a stumbling block for you, but it's not. It's not. It's not a stumbling block. It's a stepping stone. It's a stepping stone to virtue. This is where your very virtue and your very manliness that you're, you're worried about are going to come from. I, I, I'll just leave you with that because I'm ranting a lot. I'll leave you with that. It, look at your situation more deeply and see how it is the means of your salvation. I truly believe you can find that. But it will require virtuous thinking, a virtuous attitude, and that's where your virtue will grow. It'll, it'll, it'll be transmutated through your attitude towards your situation. You may, you may end up the whole, most holy of all of us. Sometimes, I, sometimes I'm a little envious. I'm grateful that I don't have certain struggles, but sometimes I look at people with certain struggles and I'm like, wow, I can see how that will benefit you in your life. Wow, it's amazing how that struggle. Read the life of uh, Padre Pio. Padre Pio, he was born sick. He had, all kind, he, was, he had all kinds of like bone problems. I mean, this guy's life was miserable. Then he suffered the stigmata, right? Where he had like, like uh, holes in his hands, all kinds of things. A lot of these guys lived under persecution, but, but it's by their very persecution that they're saved. I'll leave you with this one last story from uh, Rod Dreher, where he accounts the, the lives of the people living under Bolshevik uh, persecution in Eastern Europe during the early part of the 20th century. He tells this story, by the way, the, this is in the last chapter of the book, Live Not By Lives, and, the, and, and it's called The Joy of Suffering, something like that. It's like the benefit of suffering. It's the last chapter in the book.
And I'm going to tell you a quick story before I part ways here. Let me just get, get I think I said this to you guys last week, but it's the, the name of the chapter is the gift, the gift of suffering. So he tells this story in the chapter, a gift of suffering, the gift of suffering about a man who was um, captured and thrown into a, uh, into a, a totalitarian prison, right? Into a Bolshevik prison, right? And when he was thrown into the prison, he, uh, he saw a guy that, that had been there for a while who's very sick and he was throwing up mucus and blood. Blah, 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 right and he threw up on this new prisoner so imagine you you're in prison now and that sucks they captured you you throw you in prison and they put you next to a guy i can imagine this must have been like a cramped prison right probably a little hole and the guy that you walk in there he looks at you and throws up vomit and mucus true story throws up vomit and mucus all over you in that instant no, of course, the guy who threw up apologized and he was feeling bad. And he was like, I'm so sorry. I've been sick for weeks and I'm dying. And blah, blah. and he's sitting there with like all his mucus and vomit and, and uh, blood on him. In that moment, the man that was thrown up on, according to this story, knew that it was going to be through his sacrifice to help serve that old sick dying man that his purpose on this planet, as well as the salvation of his soul would happen. He knew in that moment that he would help this man and nurse this man until his day, dying day. Imagine getting caught, thrown in prison. First of all, that sucks. Then getting thrown up on by a sick guy who has, who has blood and mucus all over you. And then saying, wow, thank you, God for offering me this opportunity to serve this man in this prison for his sake and for the salvation of my soul. That takes a different kind of mind. It takes a different kind of heart. We're to, part of what, I love this book. Part of what this book makes you realize is we're spoiled brats, spoiled brats. And listen, I'm not yelling at you. I'm not making fun of you, but a lot of what you're saying here comes from a spoiled brat heart. And it's hard to be a spoiled brat because you're so used to having everything or seeing everybody else be spoiled because everybody else is spoiled and wondering why am I not getting the same kind of spoilage as everybody else? We're a bunch of spoiled brats. But the type of attitude, the type of mature paradigm that's required to overcome that is seen in this instant of tremendous mortification. That sucks, right? So it's a beautiful story that goes on and he does nurse this man or help this man until he dies. And there's a beautiful story about his death and how they have like a, a little funeral for him. And it's to, the whole thing was like heart touching. It was a disgusting, nasty, arduous, horrible story that touched my heart. I had goosebumps when I listened to this, this story. And in a way, I don't want to say I was jealous of him or envious of him, but I acknowledged him in my heart. I was like, wow, I hope that if I was in the same situation one day, that I would be as virtuous as that man to have done what he did. I don't know. I don't know if I could, if I went in prison, first of all, I'd be angry and scared. And then if I got thrown up on by some sick guy, I'd be like, oh man, get me away from him. Get me out of here. Right. Cause I'm a spoiled brat too. <laughs> I share all this with you just for perspective. And I want you to sort of pull yourself up out of your subjective experience for a moment. Be a little objective about yourself, which spirituality helps, religion helps. Religious, religion is all about objectivity. This is why we can't have religion today because everything is subjective. We worship ourselves. The true God today is our egos. It, our false idols aren't like, you know, the statue of Baal. Some people it is. Our false idol is pleasure. Our, self, our false idol is ego. Our, our false idol is self. That's really, that's the biggest idol today. And so these 
stories and these ideas are about being objective. And God always asks us, God asks us to be objective. What does God mean when he says, rely not on your own wisdom? It means stop being so subjective. Stop being so emotional. Stop trying to think your way out of situations. Stop judging yourself, feeling about yourself, getting depressed, being anxious. Stop, st stop being obsessed with ourselves. That's, the, that's what he's essentially saying. Don't be so obsessed with yourself, both good and bad, right? We get obsessed with ourselves when we do good. And I watched this happen with you guys and I've been warning you against it. Don't get too excited when you do good because to the degree that you're attached to your ascension is the degree that you're going to be attached to your inevitable descension. It, that's just life. It does this, right? It's, it's going to happen. What goes up must come down. But the more you're attached to up, the more you're going to be attached to down. Don't be attached to either. Be objective. You know what being objective allows you to do when things are good? It allows you to say, thereby the grace of God go I. That's People thank me these days, and I try. I hate false humility. I, I can't stand false humility. But people thank me, or they uh, compliment me, or they tell me what I what I did for them. And where I am now in my life, I can't help myself but to say, "Thank God, just thank God, thank God." Don't thank me. I didn't really do anything. It's God working through me. What that does, number one. If you're, if you're coming from false humility, it's a matter of like, that tries to make you look good. What I'm trying to do is take the, take the view away from me, take the focus off of me, because I know how dangerous that is, because I've been down that route, because everybody loved me on YouTube. I took that personally, so that when somebody didn't like me, I took it personally too. I don't do that anymore. People thank me or they praise me, and I'm very distanced with it. I'm like, whoa, 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 you know, throwing compliments. I'm like, oh, be careful, be careful, be careful. Right. Because if I take that and I hold on to it when it goes away, because it inevitably will, then I'm going to be feeling just as low as I did high. Keep the highs moderate. Keep the lows moderate. Being depressed, feeling bad about yourself is just as diabolical and disoriented as feeling proud and feeling good about yourself. Both are sinful. So that's my advice on that, man. Taking an objective viewpoint of your life by acknowledging that you're not in control and thanking God for all the good and all of the challenges that you're faced with, knowing that it's all ultimately for your own salvation and to teach you to trust God and to teach you not to worship yourself, not to worship the world, not to worship money, not to worship health. That's another one, right? Like, I get it. I'm the beast, the strongest version of yourself guy. But really, the strongest version of yourself has nothing to do with being mighty or strong yourself. It really has to do with allowing yourself to be. The only way you can allow yourself to be is if you have faith. The only way you get faith is relationship with God. So read the book of Job. Read Live Not My Lies by Rod Draher. And learn how to offer your mortification up for your salvation. Done. Yo, it's your bro, Elliot. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, you ought to know that it was a clip from one of my most recent King Transformation classes with my students, where among other things, we get together about four or five hours a week and we speak on things as it relates to becoming kings in our lives and fitness, business, and with women. If that sounds like you and you want to join a like-minded group of men who are growing stronger every day in every way in this degenerate age, then it's real simple. Just follow me on Instagram, and then DM me the word King, K-I-N-G, and then me and my team will get back to the details to see if you qualify. I really hope to see you at the next meeting. Done.